Okay, it says we're live. Um, okay. Ah, we are live. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, excellent. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is a, a work in progress, and it's an experiment for for Arcsoc. <laughs> And uh, we just figured out how to stream um, our event uh, for for Arctic to to YouTube. So uh, we were trying to figure out the the right URL and getting that right. And fortunately, we figured out this at the end. Um, I'm Nick Wilshire, as many of you know and have met before. Um, and es Esther Esmiel is our speaker this evening. And uh, we have a couple of technical things I need to walk you through before I introduce her. On the right hand side of your screen, if you signed into your Google account, you'll be able to see the uh, chat box that's uh, next to the presentation. And uh, that will allow you to ask questions during the talk. And I will be monitoring those questions as, you, as the speaker's speaking. And at the end of the talk, I'll try and summarize the questions that have come in from, from the audience. Um, and we'll pass that back to Esther to, to answer specific things in the talk. Uh, you can also view the talk in full screen the normal way you would watch any YouTube uh, video. So uh, please go ahead and watch it in full screen. And if you have a question, you can think of that question at any point during the talk and post it to the chat box on the right hand side. Uh, and then go back to full screen to to carry on with the talk. The questions will only be answered at the at the end. I think that's about about all I've got to say about the technical side of it. Um, after this talk, the video is being recorded, and we will post a link to that video to the Arcsoc website so that you can rewatch the talk at any point um, and, and share it with anyone. Okay, so without further ado, um, Esther Esmiol is the a curator at Izika Museums of South Africa and Cape Town. Her research inter interests include historical Asian ceramics as well as contemporary South African production and studio pottery. In 2012, she curated a semi-permanent exhibition called Fired at the Castle of Good Hope in Cape Town, showcasing a selection of South African ceramics from Izika's permanent collection. She also works with historical collections at Ezekiel, such as the William Fair collection of artworks and decorative art objects. And uh, over to you, Esther. Thank you, Nick. And welcome, everybody. That's, um, I can't use the word tuned in, but everybody that's um, on YouTube and, and doing this presentation. I have been looking at some presentations done by very upmarket curators, um, in fact, curators in New York at the Frick Collection, and they offer cocktails with a curator. So unfortunately, this evening, I can't um, have a cocktail at hand due to our circumstances, but I have selected a little tea bowl, blue and white porcelain tea bowl, made by the late Heim Rabinowitz, and I've got it filled with some tea. So I hope that um, you will be equally relaxed and warm and safe in your home where you're following um, this talk. Um, right, uh, so I'm going to talk to you um, this evening about um, especially Asian ceramics that landed up um, on Cape tables, not necessarily specifically always made for the Cape, but Alas, a lot of these beautiful Asian ceramics landed up on our tables um, and today feature either in museum collections or archaeologists are delving and finding more and more of uh, the fragments um, to, to, to open up and, and, and share more narratives um, of our past and our past with ceramics. But what you're looking at now, of course, is something very contemporary um, as late as 2014, 
um, when Ezeco purchased these blue and white uh, side plates from Mr. Price's home store, which is closed at the moment, I presume, under our circumstances. But um, yes, this is just to show that the blue and white, the underglazed blue pattern has endured, is still extremely popular today. And um, yes, we still use these patterns in, in, in our homes. Um, often when you turn around a cup or a saucer in your kitchen, it will still say made in China if you're not um, supporting local ceramics, um, which you should, if I may say so. But if you do still buy, um, then of course, this, this is a phenomenon that um, has lasted till today, but it is not, it is not something new. Um, we have uh, always been, uh, you know, surrounded with um, Asian ceramics that reached our shores, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. But just as a reminder, um, although imported ceramics to Southern Africa and the Cape are, uh, is part of our history, African ceramics are, of course, um, diverse in style, and we have a long, long history spanning thousands of years of beautiful, innovative ceramic objects that have been made in, in, in Africa. And I've chosen um, the Knox sculpture, which is so iconic. And of course, many members um, would know the, the, the Leidenberg heads, the seven Leidenberg heads, of which one is illustrated here, um, from uh, Leidenberg in the present day Mpumalanga province. And I've also chosen a domestic um, vessel, beautifully decorated with um, arrows and zigzag patterns, also from the Mapumalanga area, but from 1946. So this is just to tell us, to remind us that we have this very, very rich history in Africa. Asian trade ceramics, of course, um, arrived before colonial times. And I've selected a few shards um, from the Izika collection. They were collected in the um, uh, in the Zimbabwe um, area. They were not um, scientifically excavated, but we have them in our collection. They arrived in the collection in the late 19th century. There is the Celadon, uh, Chinese Celadon fragment, Persian ceramic fragments, and underglaze uh, blue porcelain fr fragments from the Yuan to the Ming dynasties. So, of course, Africa was very much connected to the Indian Ocean world and archaeological excavations at ancient trading sites, sites such as Mapungupwe and Great Zimbabwe has proven that we've, 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 been, we've had those connections um, going back many, many years. But this presentation is going to focus on the export ceramics that arrived in colonial times, um, specifically Dutch and British colonial times. My heading here is valued as highly as gold and precious jewels. And, and that is what ceramics used to be um, in the early colonial times. Of course, the Portuguese um, controlled the seas at, at, at some point. Uh, it was first Bartholomeus Dias and then Vasco da Gama, who rounded the Cape, sailing on all the way to India. Um, the events started changing for the Portuguese when the Dutch, um, the, the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, was formed in 1602, and they, of course, wanted to intercept um, the trade that was happening in the in the Indian Ocean world. Part of the reason why the VOC or the Dutch went out there to trade directly was because the port of Lisbon closed um, after 1594 and the Dutch and the English had to sail to the far corners of the world themselves. As somebody said, to distant and exotic lands as far as shines the sun and for the love of gain to explore the wire, wide world's harbors. Well, this very, very large commercial enterprise, the VOC, um, of course, trade was its raison d'etre and profit was her load star. So the VOC entered the Indian Ocean world and one of the first commodities that they um, laid their hands on was when they uh, got to some of the Portuguese Carracks that were en route to Europe 
and um, some of the ceramics on 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 these carrots, such as the blue and white. Unfortunately, it's a black and white picture, but it's blue and white crog porcelain dish. Um, and these are the kinds of ceramics that they laid their hands on first and foremost. Why crock? Of course, as archaeologists, you would all know the answer, but just um, for the record, of course, the Portuguese ships were called Caraca, and that's where the Dutch got the word crock from, or carac, from the Caraca, the carax, the crock. Um, these are very, very beautiful um, Chinese porcelain uh, made in the late Ming um, dynasty, uh, the reign of the Wanli Emperor. So uh, we're looking at um, at these beautiful um, objects, and they and they're very, very um, similarly. Or, or, or there's a pattern here. They, they 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 have the border patterns, often panels, and then at the centre you've got these beautiful decorative scenes. Here we have a locust um, sitting perched on a rock. Sometimes there would be um, birds, deer, flowers, vases arranged, but it was always this pattern of a central motif with border patterns around. Now remember, um, in the early colonial times when van Riebeek, um and his crew arrived here, this was about the time that um, Chinese uh, Crock porcelain was very, very popular. Just to remind us again that what happened locally um, at the Cape, of course, the Cape was situated on sort of halfway between Asia and Europe. So this very um, prominent position made for first just a very small crew arriving. Later on, people with um, um, set free from service in the VOC to start farms. And so the small community at the Cape um, from the mid 17th century onwards expanded. Of course, it had detrimental effects on the indigenous people, um, the, the, the Khoi, the Kukun um, people, the herders, they used these, um, uh, you know, the shadow of Table Mountain and beyond as a place where they would go um, for water resources. These were the ancestral lands, the, the grazing of livestock happened here. And they also had pottery, such as the one, a big example, Unfortunately, I don't have the, the measurements with, with me, but again, many members would know this piece very well. It is a substantially big jar with point base and lugs on the shoulder. So this is the kind of pottery that was um, at the Cape when the first colonial arrivals happened, but it was not suitable to European style cooking or hearth style cooking. So the second commander at the Cape, Zacharias Wagner, was very, very um, well, um, uh, he knew the, the Asian ceramics very, very well because he was the chief buyer, or he was in charge of the Dutch porcelain factory at Deshima in Japan from 1656 to 1658. He arrived here in 1662. One of his first complaints was, we need pottery. And he wrote in 1663 to the Batavian authorities saying that he is in dire need of pottery and of potters and that potters should be sent here. From 1665, it was recorded that pottery was made, such as the cooking pot that was excavated at the castle, illustrated here. And it was immigrant European potters that started the earthenware pottery production here at the Cape, and they continued right through the, um, the VOC period to about 1790. So this is what happened locally um, when the first colonial arri arrivals took place. What was then imported um, first and foremost, uh, it was Persian ware. Um, it was recorded in 1665 um, oh, sorry, um, it, the first the first cargo um, of imported ceramics, in fact, arrived in 1666. Same date as the foundation stone that was laid for the castle of Good Hope. So the ship, the Vest Vote, sailed from Batavia on the 7th of December 1666. In it, it had one um, case of 185 pieces of Persian ware for the Cape. There were 40 dishes, 100 plates, 25 bowls, and 20 small saucers. Why Persian ware? 
So first and foremost, Persian ware arrived here and then Japanese. Again, why Japanese? Because we're thinking Chinese, the Chinese crock porcelain. So, but what happened between the Qing and uh, between the Ming going over to the Qing dynasty around about 1644, there was this war in, in, in China between the different dynasties and the production at this wonderful center of porcelain production, Jing De Jin, was affected. So of course the Dutch, the English, the other trading companies could not get their hands on Chinese ceramics at that point. But they turned to Persian and then also to Jap Japan for supplies of porcelain. So here I have selected um, a square porcelain flask and a apothecary, apothecary bottle, um, which was which is from the Westerland, the, the wreck of the Westerland, 1697. But it forms part of um, a part of ceramics that were exported to Batavia and to the Cape to be used um, um, on ships. Of course, medicine, as we know, has always been an integral part. Um, and so the very first containers that came here were for, for medici medicinal use. Uh, the beautiful fragment of the blue and white bowl um, excavated um, from the moat of the castle and it's quite um, it's quite a big it's quite a big uh, bowl. Uh, the diameter is about 20.5. Um, dating from the late 17th century. So this is the kind of early, early, early first Japanese ceramics um, that arrived here. If we look at the Chinese ceramics, the early Chinese ceramics, the first ceramics imported, um, the dates, if I can just quickly give you that, um, the first uh, uh, Chinese porcelain arrived in 1678, then again in 1681 for official use. Good quality underglazed blue Chinese export porcelain. Um, as you can see here, there's a beautiful plate made for the Indian market. Um, and then of course the fragments, as you can see from the moat of the castle. So the plate is in our collection and the fragments um, to match. On the left is the fragments of a tiny dish, very, very fine Chinese uh, porcelain from the transition period, which is the period um, between the death of Wan Li and the appointment of an important director at the Jing De Jin, um, Porcelain uh, Center. So these are tiny, fine little pieces that arrived at the Cape. Um, right, so the other thing that is very important um, in one's work when you work with ceramics in a decorative art collection is to recreate uh, historical spaces and to do that you turn to the work of um, historians and archaeologists who have worked on land sites um, who have looked at uh, the material retrieved from shipwrecks and very importantly combined what they have found with archival records such as the inventories or the inventarison and the auctions of estates or the Venduirollen. And pioneering work in this field was done by Carolyn Woodward, the late Jane Close, and Dr. Antonia Milan, to name a few. And what is so important it, is that these inventarises inventarison gives us an idea of the type of possessions, including the ceramics, which people had in their homes, um, because these records list the contents of the house room by room, compiled room by room. So you get an idea of how many ceramics people owned and um, whether it was a status symbol. Yet the descriptions in the archaeological records are not always 100% clear or precise or consistent even. So that's why it's so important to study the records with the archaeological findings. So if we now just go back to what landed up on Cape Tables, just as in broad brush strokes, um, I've again selected um, an, an image of a small crock porcelain cup or a cry cup because it has 
a crow or a magpie sitting on a rock right at the center um, of this tiny bowl of about 7.5 centimeters in height. As I said before, the crock porcelain has a very, very nice sort of a recipe. There's the central design and then the border, the, the, the borders with the panels, larger panels interspersed with smaller panels. And some of this crock porcelain was in fact excavated um, in the, um, on the Grand Parade near the present day post office building, as well as Wagenaar's reservoir. So the production of croc uh, went, well, it was definitely still much uh, in production in the mid 17th century when the European colonists arrived. So it either could have been among their possessions, um, they must have, could have brought this to uh, 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 with them either from Asia or Batavia. Um, and then, of course, what else but the old VOC plates, the blue and white Japanese plates, of course, not for um, normal burgers, but these were specifically made from about the 1660s onwards for official use. So you would find this on the table of the governor, um, not just Batavia and other trading posts in, in, in Asia, but also at the Cape of Good Hope. And I think 12 of these large Japanese blue and white plates decorated with a VOC monogram were excavated from a well in a kitchen area of the Castle of Good Hope. So they definitely arrived here. Again, there is a link between the Japanese blue and white um, a porcelain of the 17th century, a link with a crock, the crock porcelain. Again, the central motif with the borders um, surrounding it, very popular pattern that, of course, the, um, the Dutch was used to the crock porcelain and must have influenced the Japanese porcelain as well. Not to forget the Delft, which we'll get to later on. But this blue and white pattern definitely had a very, very enduring influence on ceramics that was made elsewhere. You also see the Japanese um, blue and white plates of this, uh, the late 17th century into the 18th, early 18th century, also without the monogram. Then we um, look at the, at the lovely blue and white um, tea caddies and the hot water um, jug that I have selected here for you to enjoy. And they are from that wonderful uh, period in Chinese porcelain uh, production, the period of Kangxi, the Emperor Kangxi. Um, very, very beautiful white uh, bodied porcelain with the underglaze blue patterns. And um, one must remember that the cape received ordinary wear, such as these items, plus plates, bowls, cups and saucers, the majority decorated in underglaze blue, and they could even put together a dinner service. Um, so one can just imagine a, a, a beautiful wooden surface table laid out with all these bright, wonderful uh, blue and white ceramics. And a wide range of, of, of these kinds of ceramics have been excavated at Cape archaeological sites dating from the 17th right through to the 19th century. Very typical. Um, here are these uh, figurines of ladies in the panels, um, these slender, elegant um, women. And of course, the uh, silver that you see here are later. Okay. Maybe um, the the rims of these very delicate uh, pieces got chipped uh, through the years and they were protected with the silver or maybe just because they were valued so highly um, that they were adorned with these um, elaborate silver um, um, lids. <clears throat> Everybody's still all right out there, I hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, right, so yes, I've just 
decided let's have um, a Chinese plate from the Kangxi, um, the early um, 18th century, and just add in a blue and white Delft plate, just to show you that the border designs and the central designs, there is, there is, there is something happening there. There's the, the influence. Of course, the Delft um, body um, was not porcelain, but it was earthenware covered with a tin glaze, all to look just like the Chinese um, examples. And again, Delft appear, Delft ware appears in the Cape inventories. It's described as Delft or it's described as Father Lancia. Um, it's, uh, the, the body is thickly potted, but it's covered with this opaque white tin glaze. It's quite, it appears to be sturdy, but if you look at it closely, you can see that the rim is um, chipped, uh, so it is uh, fragile in, in that sense. Um, it is relatively scarce um, on Cape sites um, in comparison with Asian ceramics. Asian ceramics dominated at the Cape even before the mid 18th century because it was quicker and easier to obtain supplies from Batavia than waiting for stock to arrive from the Netherlands. And of course, Asian ceramics were also more sturdier than the tin glazed Delft earthenwares. From the 18th century onwards, many underglazed blue and undecorated export porcelains were taken from Jingdezhen, the center of porcelain production in China, to Canton to be decorated with colored enamels. Of course, the ordinary citizen might not have owned a plate with um, the Dutch fleet and Table Mountain. Maybe this was what was ordered by ship's captains or directors of the Dutch East India Company. Um, but some of the wealthy burghers did order polychrome painted plates um, for a dinner service, to make up a dinner service, carrying their coat of arms, such as the illustrated example that was ordered by Germany Eduard Arendts, who was a Dutch reformed minister in Stellenbosch. He arrived here in 1747, died 1749, so he didn't have a lot of um, joy from this service that he ordered. But there it was. Um, and uh, so there, there are many other of these um, armorial porcelains, small collection that we have at Ezeka um, in the Kuopmans de Vet House, the Kuopmans de Vet collection. But yeah, these enameled wares often were of a better quality as opposed to the more ordinary underglazed blue wares that were officially ordered um, by the VOC. Um, and yeah, they are uh, very much treasured today, I would think. Then um, we have more polychrome enameled wearers that I would like to share with you. Uh, the very well-known um, pinkish uh, uh, enamel that is called the Famil Rose enamels. There's also the Famil Vat, which is more the greenish enamel. Became very, very popular from the 1720s onwards. And again, these wares would have then de been decorated at Canton um, in China. <clears throat> So what I also would like to say at this point is that um, although the, the underglazed blue and white was mostly ordered officially by the VOC for uh, the burghers at the Cape, the um, polychrome wares were often ordered um, via private trade, legally or um, not so legal. So that was definitely um, a, a sign of private trade, um, the, the enameled wares. <clears throat> then also uh, we have, we, we know that the VOC didn't like um, to have competition. So the uh, public, uh, the public trade in goods profitable to the company um, had to be done in clandestine circumstances. Apparently um, some of the uh, um, women of the burghers, they, well, they did take um, visitors in because 
there were no hotels as such. So people stayed with burgers and trade happened in the food commerce um, of, 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 of the houses at the Cape. Otto Menzel, um, who described life to the, at, at, at the Cape in the 1730s, said that it was possible to purchase every conceivable article of merchandise, but never at the same place, or at the same time, or at the same price. <clears throat> so uh, let's just have a look at the um, at the uh, porcelain that was then ordered by um, for VOC officials and then also for ordinary people. For example, the free burger Jan Israels in 1670. He had six porcelain dishes, small and large, 10 bowls, small and large, and three jugs. There was a man who was a tavern keeper, Joris Jans, in 1672, and he owned 41 pieces of fine porcelain. So besides the official porcelain that arrived um, from Batavia in 1678 and 1681, free burgers already from quite an early time, even from the 1670s, as the inventories are telling us, they um, they owned ceramics. So this private trade must have been alive and well. Well, we know that it was alive and well. And these um, items that you see here, like the Imari, Japanese Imari vases and the vata pot or the water pot, the stoneware Chinese um, they arrived here at the Cape on the tables of some of the Cape um, citizens. This uh, very beautiful bowl um, is from the wreck of the Gelder Molson, 1752, or popularly known as the Nankin Cargo. Also an example, mid 18th century of very beautiful um, blue and white ceramics that would have landed up on cake tables. And this specific um, type of ware called Batavian ware has the brown glazed exterior, which ranged um, from, could range from pale yellow to coffee colored to a very dark brown color. It was an e a popular export ware from the late 17th um, to the late 18th century and is present on Cape sites. The first Cape household inventory, which mentions colored porcelain, was that of Elizabeth Luntz, and the date was 1709. And she owned inter alia 20 brown cups and saucers, 26 red and blue painted teacups, 15 red and blue saucers, six dinner plates painted blue, and 19 coffee cups and saucers painted red and green. So we definitely had more than just the normal blue and white on our tables. There was definitely colour in our lives in early colonial Cape Town. Then besides the very, very fine porcelains that landed up on our tables, we also have coarse porcelain or hover porcelain. Archaeologists refer to this as provincial or Asian market wares because it was actually made for a wide range of markets throughout Asia and communities linked to these trade networks, including the Cape, received um, of, uh, of coarse porcelain. It's different from the fine um, Chinese export porcelain. It's quite a heavily potted ware, um, painted with simple flowing designs, usually in underglaze bloom. And sometimes the inside of these bowls have an unglazed ring because in the manufacturing process or the production process, they would have been stacked on top of each other. So without the glaze, this unglazed ring, it was just part of that, um, part of the process and they could um, fit more in into the kilns. So they were they were not made at Jing de Zhen, the, the porcelain center. They would have been made in Southern China at private kilns in southern China and provinces of Fujian and Guangdong. It was widely used as domestic pottery in China and also exported to Southeast Asia and to the Cape, as I've said before. Of course, porcelain most probably was not intended for the, for the European tables, the European market. It was firstly too bulky 
uh, to be to be shipped economically, and furthermore, it was perhaps just simply deemed too crude to meet the European taste for fine porcelain. Another kind of coarse porcelain, slightly earlier than the, the previous um, example, is the so-called swatar wares, also made in southern China, named after the port Swatow, and they date from the 16th to the 17th centuries, and also arrived at the Cape. It is scarce, but um, it has been found on Cape sites. Um, usually um, decorated in underglazed blues, which is the one example that you can see here, or also polychrome, uh, polychrome enameled um, decorations. Very popular. I love them. Right, back to the Nanking cargo or the Helder Malson, um, which we know popularly as the Nanking cargo. Of course, the captain Michael Hatcher in 1986 retrieved this cargo um, from the South China Sea and it was sold in Amsterdam under the name Nanking Cargo. There is this beautiful link between the Nanking Cargo and the Cape in that um, Jörg has described the fact that the car, that the coarse porcelain on board was intended for the Cape. Because that year in 1751, um, the supplies were, um, were directed, uh, directly um, loaded for the Cape. Um, and there's, we know that there's not a big market um, in Europe for coarse porcelain. So it must have been, it must have been intended for the Cape. So, um, Cape sites, large numbers are being excavated of this um, uh, coarse porcelain or grove porcelain. And, um, but it's not always very clearly described as such in, in the official documents. Um, they sometimes just refer to as spool common uh, or finger bowls or slop bowls. Um, and bowls and saucer dishes are the most common forms of the coarse porcelain um, found. On Cape sites. So who owned ceramics then at the Cape? Um, and that is where my work comes in when we look, when we work with um, recreated uh, historical interiors and we try to match the furniture and the paintings and the ceramics. This room here, um, I'm sure it's well known to, to, to all of you. It's one of the period rooms, recreated period rooms in the Skundas house of the castle, the 18th century room. And in the display cabinet, we have craft porcelain, which is of an earlier uh, uh, era. Um, but people, wealthy burghers like the Dumanis, Francois Rainier Dumanis and his wife, whose portraits um, uh, we have in, in the room, they, earn, they owned porcelain of a later date, the underglazed blue Nanking type porcelain or Nanjing type porcelain from the late 18th to early 19th century. We don't have any of that in that room. I think um, one of our historians, Kara Woodward, in her a very famous book on Oriental Ceramics at the Cape of Good Hope, said that the museums um, are overflowing with this kind of um, uh, ceramic, this kind of Chinese ceramic. And yes, it is true, you do find this in all our museums, but we know that the Dumanis had this. We, in fact, had a, have a small uh, part of, of, of the ceramics that was donated by one of the family members in, in recent years. And they also took this along as they trekked to the, the various farms that they owned in the Overberg and all around Cape Town. So we don't have that in that room, so maybe that is something that in a small way one can try and um, introduce. What we certainly don't have in the room is the the Hrobe porcelain, the coarse porcelain, such as the Nanking cargo bowl, as I've got illustrated on the left in the middle there. Um, is where uh, Antonia Milan and Jane Close um, has found very interesting information from the uh, from the official records. Um, they found, or they have um, written about Jan de Souza van Kali Patnam in 1705. His inventory shows 
that he owned three spool common and one pirang. So that's three bowls and one saucer dish. I don't know if this is, um, of course, this is um, 1750. So it would have been spool common or a, a coarse porcelain from an earlier period. But it's, it's interesting that free black people um, had this kind of ceramic um, in, in their homes because Jan de Souza was a, a, a slave. He was brought as, a, as an enslaved person to the Cape from the east coast of India. And he lived in someone else's house in Cape Town. But 1705 inventory clearly states that he owned spool common. In addition, he owned a brass saucer dish, a single saucepan and a rice block and stamper, which are items linked to a rice and relish diet, not requiring the use of plates. It thus seems that Jan continued the lifestyle and culinary traditions of his original homeland here at the Cape. Similarly, Jan van Makassar, his inventory dated to 1709, he possessed tableware only in the form of porcelain saucer dishes and as many as 24. Milan and Close have interpreted these inventoried saucers and bowls or spool common as being items made of coarse porcelain and they are of the opinion that free black families chose to use coarse porcelain because the shapes in which it was available were more familiar and suited to their customs and cuisine. The wear, the wear was more affordable to acquire and of a sturdier nature to use on a daily basis. I find that very interesting and I would like to, to um, expand our exhibition to include that kind of information. I think that um, we're reaching the end of the VOC period towards the um, 1795, 1800s. Um, it must just be remembered that um, although we get come to the end of the VOC period and we're going into the British um, colonial period, the prevalence for Chinese and Japanese porcelain never really left the Cape. Um, the strong, the Cape's strong cultural and business links with Asia um, ensured that Asian ceramics arrived on our shores. When the British took over, First in 1795 and then again in 1806, British ceramics started um, coming onto the market and large numbers of British ceramics were exported to the Cape. Um, <clears throat> the majority of household uh, ceramics uh, supplied during that time came from the Staffordshire area in England. Um, and British ceramics with printed decorations such as uh, willow pattern plate, very familiar popular willow pattern plate, they're commonly found on Cape archaeological sites. They're probably The willow pattern is probably one of the most popular designs um, ever. Um, the, just for interest, the pattern was derived but not copied from painted Chinese landscape designs appearing on Chinese export porcelain. So again, there's a link between the Chinese export porcelain and British porcelain. Uh, the teapot and the coffee can. Why is it a teapot and coffee can? Oh, that's right. They had tea, teacups and coffee cans and uh, the sauces would go either with the tea or the coffee, depending on what you were drinking. But what is interesting is this beautiful um, uh, pot um, and coffee can is made of bone china and all British porcelain, in fact, after 1815, was made of bone china. Um, it was developed at the end of the 18th century and was made of a mixture of porcelain clay and porcelain stone. And it had a percentage of animal or cattle bone ash, which allowed for the creation of white, translucent and strong and a strong porcelain body. Here at the bottom, you will see um, Derby, uh, porcelain, British porcelain, very similar to the Japanese Imari pattern that we've seen before. So there is this influence that is enduring and it actually goes right through to modern times. If you look at the, um, the two jugs made by Henny Mayer, very minimalistic decoration, but this combination of the underglazed blue, of the blue and white, is enduring very much in the way that he makes from time to time. Another um, 
contemporary ceramic artist, um, Michael Chandler. He really loves the VOC pattern, um, VOC plates. And uh, yes, there's one of the charges that he has hand painted with a design similar to the VOC patterns. Um, Hilton Null, a very famous South African ceramic artist, once said that one of the interesting things about ceramics is that traditions have always borrowed from each other quite freely. Just as the Japanese ceramics had been influenced by Korean and Chinese, so were the potters in Holland and England um, influenced by Asian ceramics. And so the um, and so the 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 traditions um, continue. If I can just um, end off um, this 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 talk um, with something that Michael has said, Michael Chandler has said about the the platters. He calls them his crack platters, and this is what he has said. Um, as an artist who paints these plates um, himself. He says that the pattern has a joyous rhythm which sweeps in circular movements beneath the surface of the glaze. The pictorial language of the decorative elements is well proportioned and balanced without feeling trite or contrived. Executed in the subtle cool tones of cobalt blue, Chandler believes these dishes to be truly eternal and hopes that by painting them and exploring them, he might understand a little more about the success of this age old design. Of course, none of this work can happen without consulting um, various sources. And I've just given you a short list of um, some of the works that I have that I'm working with quite um, often. And yeah, that's that's it for this evening. And that's my last. Thanks. Yes, that was wonderful. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> no, you were, that was perfect. Uh, 45 minutes. Um, we, oh, no, that was perfect. Um, yes, no, no. Um, yes, thank you, Esther. And uh, yeah, you're our guinea pig for the first ArcSoc YouTube live event. Um, so thank you very much. I see my, my webcam for some reason, wasn't supposed to be in the middle of your talk. Um, so it, it, uh, throughout the, the presentation, it's sort of stuck there and I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, we'll figure out the, we'll figure out the glitches as we go along with this. And to all of you attended, um, there are more than 30 of you that, that uh, joined the, the stream this evening. Thank you very much uh, for, for joining for the first event. I hope there are many more people for the next talk as well. And uh, we welcome ideas um, that we could bring into this format. Um, it's obviously a very weird, strange time um, with, uh, with lockdown, but we trying this new format out and we actually want to be quite creative. And um, the advantage of coming up with the YouTube stream is that we can actually reach people that are staying in um, Manus or all over the, the country that are members. Um, I know some members are in Betty's Bay um, and uh, they could never really come to the talks uh, on a regular basis. So uh, I think that's opening up new opportunities and I hope people enjoy them and look forward to them for the, for the coming months. So Esther, you have a few questions, um, mainly from Ronnie. And I think many people have joined the stream without signing into a Google account before, um, which is fine. It just means they were limit, limited in being able to post a question to the, to the live chat. So for um, anybody um, joining in on the next um, talk, just remember to sign into um, your Google account before you join the stream. And the options of being able to post a question into the live chat will, will appear on the right hand side. So we had one statement uh, from Rose just mentioning that um, the 17th century VOC dishes are sold for high prices at the Strauss sale on Monday for 250,000 Rand, which is incredible. <laughs> um, and uh, Ronnie has uh, a 
Yeah. <laughs> Ron, Ronnie Glass has got a few questions. He wanted to ask about uh, the underglazed, you, if you could explain the underglazed term and also tin glaze. So let's start with, um, with those questions first. So underglazed and uh, what is the other one? Tin glazed, that's right. Hmm. Great. And then we've got um, another question from Ronnie about where are the uh, beautiful ceramics um, on display, presently on display? Uh, Esther, I'm going to just end and restream just one sec. I think there might be a little technical glitch at the end. Okay, hopefully that pulls through. Um, yeah, so uh, hopefully, um, they, 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 yeah, there have been various people who have logged onto the chat on the right and 
some um, more positive um, support, uh, you know, and um, you know, congratulations. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, Ronnie also asked about. Um, I think it was rough and normal pottery. Uh, what, what? Mm. Uh, just to explain that. Um, fine porcelain it's a more um uh, sturdier body uh, a thicker body but it was made in southern china at, at, at provincial kilns and private kilns not at jindajang and it was really made for general use all over asia um, and landed up at the, at the cape as well so the fine porcelain is is really um thin, um, nearly translucent. It's got a high ring if you sort of ping against it, where your um, grof or your coarse porcelain um, does not have those, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's different, it's more sturdier. Um, but it has this very beautiful, um, personally, for me, I like the more loose uh, patterns. Um, there's, there's, there's sort of a, a, yeah, it's not as um yeah sorry my english is failing me <laughs> of this three quarters of an hour but it's not as, yeah. as um you know as tight uh, um, uh, the, the the decoration it's more flowing and uh, uh, it's just more, right. no, more I think popular that's, wear yeah that's sorry yeah. i want yeah, to I think the whole <laughs> yes no 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 problem i think sorry to everyone um at the end there i think we we had three scenes set up for the talk um uh the uh the last scene just the this parts of the questions i think got a bit chopped off or um you know some of the audio and so on so we apologize for that um but the the whole talk itself was uninterrupted as i, I got that through uh, and i was watching the stream um so we will we will fix that on the next time round. this is our first time ever doing this and there's some things we weren't <laughs> able to test out um so and, and I can also, uh, if if there are questions that you felt weren't answered, I, I can also get Esther to email, um, you know, and we can post it to the event page as well. Um, just about, and we can um, have those answers on the on the event page. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, and um, you know, the uh, it's just really exciting to try this out for the first time. And, um, you know, the, um, you know, the, uh, I think the talk went very well. Unfortunately, I can't thank you, Esther, with some, a bottle of wine or, uh, or anything <laughs> like that. Um, so until, until the next time, until we all meet again in person. Um, but, yes. uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for thank doing you. this and, uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And thank just have a lovely everyone. evening. Yeah. Right. Be safe. Right. Great. Thank you. Nick. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Take care. Bye.